Ladies and gentlemen, my field indeed is mathematics, but most of my research is what I consider mathematical physics. That is also the title of my talk. I also give you two subtitles, um, Laws of Nature Tangle with Logic, suggesting that there is a conflict in putting together uh, the physics and the logical description we want to give to it. All, or alternatively, laws of nature entangle with logic, which means that there's a, a close relationship between the two fields. So what is mathematical physics? You could start from one of the many attempted definitions of the field, like this one uh, given by the Journal of Mathematical Physics. I will take a different approach, though. I will explain mathematical physics to you in different terms. Galilei famously wrote that the book of nature is written in the language of mathematics. And I think we are all very familiar with that fact, whether we look at uh, understanding of uh, mechanics, heat, magnetism, uh, any feature of nature. Uh, we're not surprised that they are described by mathematical formulas. The same uh, idea was uh, expressed so somewhat differently uh, by Richard Feynman, a theoretical physicist and uh, a Nobel laureate, who said something to the effect uh, in, in his series of lectures on the character of physical law. He said something to the effect, the more we investigate and the, the, and the more laws we find and the deeper we penetrate nature, this disease that every one of our laws is a purely mathematical statement in rather complex and astute mathematics. And he went on, I think, never finishing the sentence. But his message was clear. All of our successful theories of physics up to now have been based on mathematics. And that seems to be the general character of physical law. The mathematics needed for the description of physics is not always simple. You need advanced mathematics, as pointed out by Feynman. In fact, occasionally at the time of the physical discovery, the mathematics is not yet developed. And that leads to a certain amount of conflict. Feynman himself, for instance, in his uh, studies of um, quantum field theories, used notions such as Feynman path integrals, very useful tools, but also notoriously ill-defined mathematical objects, as well as Feynman diagrams, which represent uh, terms in a series expansion, which is known not to converge to any finite number. Uh, yet physicists uh, successfully uh, use pieces of that series to, to produce numbers and compare with experiments. So it is now not always simple to put together uh, the laws of nature and their mathematical description. Feynman made another important remark uh, about the language used in the book of nature. He said that mathematics is not just a language, it is a language plus reasoning meaning that once you've formulated in precise terms your physical theory, it becomes amenable to the analysis, the logical analysis, the logical reasoning that is at the core of all mathematics. This is the deep entanglement between the logics, logic and the laws of uh, nature. These two comments by Feynman also represent what I think are the two typical tasks uh, of a mathematical physicist. First, to provide a well-defined and precise mathematical formulation of a physical theory which is not always simple, as uh, witnessed by the examples of Feynman diagrams and Feynman path integrals. And second, once the formulation has been given, uh, deduce logical consequences of that starting point. And if things go well, those logical uh, consequences are physically relevant facts that match with the physical reality. It could equally well be uh, that you obtain unphysical consequences. And then it is up to the physicist to go back to the original uh, formulation and either discard the theory altogether, or at least better understand the uh, limits to the validity of the assumptions that went into the formulation. Uh, so logical reasoning alone will not uh, reveal truths truth about the nature, but uh, for that uh, we also need uh, the radio eyes and the satellites of my distinguished colleagues. I will now move on to uh, more specific topics within mathematical physics that reflect some aspects of my own research. I'll start from a physical insight uh, that developed uh, during a, a large part of the 20th uh, century. If you've never seen it, you should be surprised by it. Uh, it seems even incredible. It states that critical systems of statistical physics seen from far away are described by quantum field theories. But 
Quantum field theories were developed for elementary particle physics, whereas statistical physics is our um, understanding of why thermodynamics holds. So why should these two different domains of physics be described by the same mathematical formalism? And I will not be able to provide you the full answer here. Uh, parts of uh, uh, this remain a mystery up to today, but uh, there's also uh, a uh, good understanding, especially based on the renormalization group for which Wilson got a uh, um, Nobel Prize in uh, 1982 of this fact. It is also a very successful paradigm in physics. So I will now explain a few um, notions uh, within, um, uh, within this uh, statement. Statistical physics, in particular, is the domain of physics which studies uh, systems which consists of an enormous number of uh, simple microscopic constituents, which interact with each other typically in simple ways. But yet the system collectively uh, behaves in subtle ways. Think, for instance, of water molecules bouncing off of each other uh, and forming either a liquid or a gas, uh, which would be very difficult to tell on the molecular level. So the collective behavior, especially at criticality, can be complicated. Also, when I say seen from far away, there is an underlying specific notion to that, uh, the notion of a scaling limit. The models have a microscopic length scale, say, the distance between two nearest molecules in the system, and from our perspective, that is a tiny number. And if that number is a parameter in our mathematical model, the scaling limit uh, represents the idea of letting that parameter tend to zero and considering the limit of the system. So for instance, these pink and blue uh, disks seen from further away might look more like that. And then you're supposed to keep zooming out and take the limit. Well, a mathematician would interrupt and say, limit, uh, do we know that the limit even exists? And for the most part, the answer is that we do not rigorously know that the limit exists. Uh, yet this has proven extremely successful to assume that the limit exists. So let's uh, leave the mathematician aside for a minute and make the story even more interesting. If we look at specifically two-dimensional uh, critical systems, then they're not described by just any quantum field theory. They're described by quantum field theories with infinite dimensional symmetries, conformal invariance. This was observed by um, Belavin, Polyakov, and Chamolochikov in 1984. On the right-hand side is... Uh, I've used my uh, limited artistic skills to illustrate what a conformal transformation looks like. But on the level of the, the quantum field theory, uh, it manifests itself uh, through representations of what is known as Virasoro algebra, a certain infinite dimensional Lie algebra. And this symmetry has tangible, concrete, and specific... Uh, physical consequences. For instance, it, in most cases, allows us to identify the exact values of critical exponents of these systems. It also uh, allows us to uh, solve the correlation functions because uh, of partial differential equations satisfied by them as a consequence of the symmetry. If we now let the mathematician enter again, uh, she will be shocked because uh, she now faces not only the task of um, proving that the scaling limit exists, but also uh, of establishing all these fantastic properties that physicists tell the scaling limit should possess. And uh, the rest of my uh, talk, uh, I will report a little bit on the mathematical progress on understanding such features, uh, with a bias towards my own work. So. Um, Let's consider a quintessential uh, model of statistical physics known as the Ising model. Um, it represents a uniaxial ferromagnet. Uniaxial just means that there's one axis and the constituents of the matter are um, magnetized um, in one direction or the other uh, along that axis. So the pluses and minuses here represent uh, the directions of the magnetizations. Uh, and in thermal equilibri equilibrium, the configuration of pluses and minuses is random. Ferromagnet here represents the fact that it is energetically favorable for two neighbors to be pointing in the same direction rather than the opposite direction. So you prefer to agree with your neighbors rather than to disagree. 
if you look at the picture and draw red lines uh, wherever um, a pair of neighbors disagree, we obtain a collection of random curves that looks like this. Uh, it's random because the underlying configuration of directions was random. And such a random geometry description uh, has been used uh, almost 80 years ago to actually provide uh, a proof that in low temperature this model uh, behaves uh, ferromagnetically, whereas in high temperature it behaves paramagnetically, and in between, at a specific Curie temperature, uh, there's a phase transition between the two. It is a more recent development uh, to use this random geometry description for formulating the scaling limit entirely. Namely, if we look at the picture and now let the microscopic length scale uh, become smaller uh, and pay attention only on the random curves in the picture, we see something like that. And perhaps these random curves are more amenable to the mathematical analysis that is needed for establishing a scaling limit. Indeed, a breakthrough result of um, Smirnov and collaborators uh, proved that if you impose uh, opposite boundary conditions on two sides of your um, piece of material in, in this model, then the unique uh, macroscopic uh, interface that separates pluses from minuses uh, does have a scaling limit, and it is uh, a random curve known as caudal SLE3. So this was one of the first times we got access to... Um, we were able to uh, understand that the scaling limit of this random geometry description actually exists. With Clemmer Hongler, uh, we gave a generalization of the result, uh, which allowed for the presence of also free boundary conditions. And the relevance of that generalization is that physicists tell us that uh, uh, these three boundary conditions appearing here are the only ones that can meaningfully exist in the scaling limit. So mathematicians formulate their results uh, in uh, theorems, uh, but since I will not be able to give the proper definitions anyway, I will uh, let the two pictures speak for themselves and omit the statements. Uh, how about these other consequences uh, uh, that physicists tell us that the um, symmetry should have and the, the scaling limit should possess? In particular, um, uh, the quantum field theory that describes uh, the scaling limit of this system was supposed to have Virasoro algebra acting on the set of fields of the theory. Is there anything similar to that uh, in the statistical physics model of random pluses and minuses in the plane? It turns out that uh, there indeed is, and a recent result of Klemmer Hongler, Frederick Wiglund and myself uh, shows that the space of random variables obtained uh, by looking at uh, only finite pieces of this configuration of pluses and minuses locally, that space carries a representation of the Virasaro algebra as well. So we have the exact same structure on this probabilistic or statistical physics type of uh, model as we do have on the quantum field theory. So that allows you to start making correspondences between the two. I want to give one more example of a recent result uh, done in our research group here, um, by uh, jointly with Alex Carrilla and Evelina Peltola. It combines a little bit of these random curves and some of the powerful consequences of the Virasara symmetry in the form of partial differential equations. And the model you might not ex immediately recognize as a statistical physics model. I choose a uniform random labyrinth, namely a picture of this sort fr where from any place you find a path to any other place, but essentially in only one way, so it's, it is as complicated as it gets. Uh, then among such pictures, you choose one uniformly at random. To pass to the scaling limit, you let the labyrinth mesh become smaller, uh, so you obtain a large labyrinth, and we were able to show that um, certain probabilities are governing um, long walls in the labyrinth with proper renormalization, as one should do in, in quantum field theories, have a limit, have a scaling limit, and this limit uh, not only exists, but actually satisfies exactly the system of partial differential equations that conformal field theory predicts for it. So here is the specific system. Uh, I think it was one of the first times that uh, 
such equations could be established rigorously uh, for the scaling limit of correlations in these models. I don't know if these equations appeared in Galilei's Book of Nature, but maybe in the next edition they will. Uh, okay, I will conclude by um, just... Uh, I, w I wanted to con convey to you uh, that uh, physical ideas really inspire some of the best mathematics of today, just like they did in the time of Newton. Uh, whether it's in combinatorics, uh, partial differential equations, random geometry or infinite dimensional algebra, uh, physics really inspires the mathematics research. Mathematical physics uh, aims at laying a solid logical foundation for physical theories, and as such is very important. Much of the time, we end up uh, confirming what the physicists had arrived at by other methods. But just occasionally, something new is revealed in the process of uh, looking at the system in logically more careful terms. And with this, I conclude my talk and thank you for your attention.